I think the, the responses that individuals, families and households have had to make to facilitate the, if you like, reduction or the stopping of, of transmission are one, is one of the biggest adjustments and the most important part of this response. For the moment, we are not certain when we will start to see the end of this, of this outbreak. We have seen some countries emerge, if you like, at the other end of a peak, countries such as China. We believe that South Korea is on that path. They are being very uh, deliberate in releasing and letting go some of these restrictions. I've seen people from China come out, get out into their gardens for the first time in the last few days and be very joyful. But even their movement is still limited. I think uh, we all need to make sure that we open up these spaces for people to start moving around, but at the same time are monitoring very carefully the evolution on a day-to-day -day basis, if there are any new infections, any new cases, until we can let life go back to normal. Well, I think at, at, at the continental level, one of the first that uh, was very important for us was that, as I said earlier, diagnostic capacity was very limited in the region. And at the beginning of all this, we had only two laboratories that were able to diagnose this, this virus. So they offered their services to other African countries. So we were shipping specimens to Dakar at the Institute Pasteur and to South Africa at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases. And they were carrying out this function of uh, confirming uh, cases for other countries. They've also very much been involved in the training that we've carried out uh, for other countries. We've seen an exchange of capacities of experts between countries where um, some have been able to learn from others. We have seen ministers of health networking among themselves to exchange their own experiences, to offer each other ideas. I, I think there's been a real uh, openness to provide support to each other among African countries, and I'm, I'm certain that we'll continue to see the solidarity manifesting itself. The private sector has also offered its services. So we've seen an outpouring of uh, support, particularly from some of the communications uh, companies, and we're going to be very soon actually uh, working with them in order for people to get essential messages about how to protect themselves, how to protect others through the partnership with these companies. We've seen real international generosity and solidarity around this, uh, this outbreak. Of course, the, the example of this uh, Jack Ma Foundation, which has decided to offer one of the most acutely needed commodities in the response uh, test kits, is a very exciting example. We've also seen generosity on the part of international funders and donors, uh, some of the donor countries. The European Union, for example, has offered funding, particularly to low-income countries in the greatest difficulties. The World Bank has uh, released some funding, has announced $12 billion of uh, funding of different types. Um, quite a few countries have, have, have offered uh, financing. Some of the foundations have offered their support. We have seen some of the pharmaceutical companies offering what they can do in order to support uh, what is going on. So I think there really has been a real demonstration of solidarity, of being um, available to have their commodities, have their capacities used in order to address this global pandemic. I think it's important to start at the level of individuals and people in their homes. So what, what we have learned from the Ebola outbreak, which is being applied now, is how to start to work early at the community level. Because communities can be important, even at the start of an outbreak, around surveillance and recognizing patterns of illness. So we have engaged very strongly, working through community groups, on uh, dissemination of information about the pattern of the illness, about what to do to protect oneself. We've also learned that um, it's important not only to tell people things, but it's important to listen, to hear, and to incorporate that information into adjusting our strategies. There is a huge amount of uh, information, some of it incorrect, that's circulating about 
this virus, about this, this pandemic. And we're finding it very important to have learned from the Ebola experience to reach out, not just send radio messages, talk to people, hear them, and then adjust what we are doing according to that. We've also um, built very much on the capacity that had already been put in place for the Ebola outbreak. So, for example, some of the laboratory testing capacity was built around the Ebola experience. We learned a lot from the point of entry screening of people through the work on the Ebola. We have set up now an extremely strong partnership with the, the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, which is the sister UN agency that works on, on this aspect. We have learned a lot also about the rapid exchange of um, capacities between countries, lab capacity. One of the things that I'm hoping very much will, will help us in relation to the lessons learned from the Ebola outbreak is testing out therapeutics even as we are using them. So if like carrying out what might be called clinical trials, but seeing if certain treatments are appropriate. That was one of the huge lessons that we learned, how to bring partners together. And we are seeing now a very exciting, uh, if you like, coalition, many coalitions of technical agencies, the private sector, uh, WHO and other technical agencies coming together to look at therapeutics, to look at uh, vaccine development. I think these are some of the precious lessons that came out of the Ebola outbreak, which will be very useful for this pandemic. Really, we're all in this together. That's one. And then as part of that message, solidarity, sympathy, helping and supporting each other is what's going to bring us out of this uh, outbreak. Starting at the individual level, I've been very impressed to see how individuals have offered their time to support. So, if, for example, in the context where movement of people is prohibited, young people have been willing to go and help elderly people to do their shopping. We are starting to see more and more of this in African countries, so we will need to, to do this. We've seen very much how uh, people are prepared to share their knowledge with each other, to share information, to support each other throughout this outbreak. So I, I, and we've seen the solidarity also among countries, how countries are, are ready to offer the lessons that they've learned. So for example, the fact that uh, China was prepared to send some of its experts to a European country to help to quickly bring to bear the lessons that they've learned is a sort of international solidarity that we, we expect to see. So, and one of the most important demonstrations of this solidarity, in my view, is to not only protect ourselves, but to be responsible in protecting others. So those lessons we have to learn about not shaking each other's hands, not greeting in certain ways, giving up going to church, even if we find that a very important part of our daily life, are demonstrations that we are thinking of other people, even as we think of ourselves. And that's the message that I'd like to leave. If the government announces measures that they think would like, are going to make a difference, let us not wait until we're being policed and chased. It is very important that we do that ourselves responsibly as individuals and minimize the effort then to enforce some of these very important practices that will help to stop the virus.